So welcome everybody to the um, GIC, uh, to the Greenfield Intercultural Center. Uh, my name is Kia Lohr and I am, let's see. My name is Kia Lohr and I am the Associate Director of the Greenfield Intercultural Center, also known fondly as the GIC, you'll hear us refer to. Um, and I'm also a Penn GFE alumna from the class of 2016. So welcome everybody to this preceptorial on the danger of a single Big Lee story. Big Lee stands for first generation low income. Uh, and we have five current Penn students who will be sharing their stories as first gen low income students and their experience at Penn and how they, you know, came to Penn and navigate through Penn and some of the insights and wisdom that they have to share. Uh, you'll also get to know each of them later on as they share their stories. So they'll introduce themselves then. And the purpose of this session is to share insights, wisdom, inspiration from upper class students to incoming students um, like all of you in the class of 2024. And for for those of you who are first generation low income students, um, may, may these stories serve as mirrors for you as you enter into the Penn community. And if you are not a first generation low income student, may these stories serve as windows for you as you enter into the Penn community. Um, so with that, this is kind of set up as a story circle. If we were in person at, on campus, um, we would be sitting in a circle and the stories would, the students will be telling their stories. Um, but since we're doing it virtually, um, then we have this in, in a chronological order. So the five speakers are going to go in this order. Nair Locklear is going to go first. Uh, um, Mashaya Collins is going to go second. Shakshi is going to go third. John and then Erica. So this is the, the story um, format. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Nair. So Nair, um, you are first to share your story. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nair Locklear. I'm a rising sophomore in the School of Nursing and I'm from Aberdeen, North Carolina. So I'd just like to uh, start off firstly by thanking you all for being here and allowing us to share our stories with you. And I'd like to say that I have spent a lot of my life believing that I was normal. Uh, now that I'm a little older, I've seen more of the world and more people and I know that normal is subjective. My life is not the same as everyone else's and my, so my normal is not the same as everyone else's. But at the same time, you and I are just alike. So I'd like to share a little bit about my normal with you all today. Um, I've been raised in the same house all my life, um, small town, rural North Carolina. Um, I'm the eldest of two daughters um, and the daughter of two working class Native Americans. Um, my parents both had uh, certificates in, in trade skills. Um, so they didn't uh, go to college in the traditional sense. They have certificates to do what they do. It's like a one-year program. Um, and they, they worked hard. Um, there were times growing up when uh, my dad had three jobs at one time and my mom would work a day and night shifts at uh, the local hospital. Um, money was always tight and I grew up knowing that, but um, I was often shielded from the realities of what that meant. So um, it, the concept really of, of what it meant to be from a low income family were um, lost on me for a long time. And uh, the concept of being first generation low income was not something I really thought much about till I was a senior in high school. Um, although, I don't have uh, a lot of memories from before um, probably elementary school. I, I was always a happy kid, uh, pretty shy. Uh, I love my parents and my little sister and they love me. We went to church every Sunday. Life was good, normal, simple, normal. And you know, that was that. Um, education has always been a priority in my life. Uh, my parents wanted us to have a better education than what they received because they were firm believers in education being the ticket into a better life. It worked for them. Um, until I started Penn, my parents held the highest level of education so far in my family. Um, they ha had payments on a house and cars and to them that's what success meant. Um, no matter what they had to sacrifice in order to present this idea of success. Um, so that was always uh, instilled in me from a young age. 
um, they applied to have my sister and I transferred into the school system in the county next to where we lived. Um, the area where I actually live is um, also a minority low income community, but the county next door um, is predominantly white, uh, middle class and upper middle class. Um, so going to school there gave us a lot more opportunities and it also made my, made my perception of what um, the United States looked like very different than the realities. Um, all my teachers were, were, were white. Um, I think I had one teacher who was a person of color my entire like K through 12 education. Um, so that definitely impacted a, a lot of my perception of myself. I didn't um, really embrace a lot about my uh, Native American culture because it wasn't that my parents didn't want me to or that they weren't encouraging me to be myself, but it was always uh, this idea that in order to fit in, in order to be, um, in order to fit into the this idea of of success that I also had to blend in more with the average people in my in my school systems. So that uh, definitely impacted me me a lot. Um, getting back to my education itself, uh, my mom uh, taught me to read and write before I started school. Um, and after that, I never stopped reading. Um, I Because I was so shy, I read a lot. And uh, my parents also motivated me to learn and explore through the things I read. And uh, a lot of it was that I just considered myself to be a nosy child. I wanted to know everyone's business. That's pretty much what that was. Uh, my parents would have pri private conversations and spell out words so that I wouldn't be able to understand them. But uh, in actuality, they were doing it on purpose so that I would learn more. So education has been at the center of uh, the way I was brought up. I have never known anything other than education and family to be uh, the center of my life. Uh, that being said, the plan for me, as was the same plan for my mom and my grandmothers and the generations of post-colonial Native women before me, was to get as much education as possible, only secondary to family commitments as they cropped up, to get married and become a homemaker. Um, I would get a job if my husband allowed it, not really, it was never expected of me to have a career, but a job. And the expectation was that everything I did would be for the betterment of my family, especially as the eldest daughter, these ideas were ingrained in me. It wasn't until high school when the idea of college really became, college and a career really became possible for me. I assumed that if I got to go, I would be attending the local college that other kids from my tribe attended and that I would be paying for it with the money that I saved in a little box in my nightstand. Uh, I would never have asked my parents for money. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I, I definitely was understanding more so what it meant when my parents always said, quote unquote, that money was tight, um, being as ambiguous as that was. Um, college was my ambition, and although I had little means at the time of achieving it, I didn't realize that, um, especially after my mom was diagnosed with cancer during my freshman year of high school, and she lost her job, so suddenly money became even more than tight. Um, seeing everything my mom went through as a patient led me to decide to become a nurse, which is what I'm studying here. And uh, I knew that I could get a two-year degree from the local community college for $500 a semester for tuition. So it was a practical decision um, to seek nursing as my, as my job slash career. Um, as my mom became more and more sick, I became her caretaker and I started raising my sister. Um, my dad held pretty desperately to the one steady income we had, which is his job. And so he worked long hours. Um, when my mom passed away a year later, my life became very clearly not as normal as I it once was or as it once thought it would be. Um, and her medical and life insurance benefits had gone out about a month before she passed away. So our financial situation became more and more bleak. So while the emotion, emotional turmoil stretched me thin, 
I had to take on my mom's responsibilities in the house and keep up my grades and watch after my sister. And the pressure of that kind of turned my optimism a bit sour. I started to look for rebellion anywhere I could find it and while maintaining my responsibilities. But I still always held up the importance of my education um, at first only because I knew that it was what my mom would have wanted and I did not want to disappoint uh, her memory. Um, and I also knew that my education would be, could be the one ticket out of my hometown into job security that my family needed um, to make sure that my dad didn't have to work himself to the bare bone in a laborious job that he couldn't stand for his entire life. And also the, the thought of going away for college, going out of North Carolina was kind of the one quiet, selfish thing I tried to let myself have. Um, so I took, you know, I did what, what every, you know, high achieving, low income student does, what definitely, well, any high achieving student does. And I took the hardest classes, studied for the ACT and SAT, applied for every scholarship I could and applied to a lot of colleges. And, you know, one thing led to another and now I'm at Penn, so it did work out, but um, it was definitely if it wasn't for my mom and my dad and my guidance counselors, teachers who took a special interest in me, um, my coach, definitely God, all the people in my life who went out of their way so that I could make something of myself and make something special of my life, I wouldn't have access to a top tier education. Um, with that, I do want to say that uh, going to college is not going to solve all of my problems. I would be naive to assume or expect that it would. Um, I attend a university, an Ivy League university, in a country that was not built for me or people like me to succeed. Uh, I'm a Native American woman, first generation university student from a low income rural family. This place is not made for me, but I try to make a space for myself and for people like me and for my family after me. Uh, coming to Penn, especially, was the first time I had ever left the South. Uh, it was the first time I had ever seen so many brown people in one place. Um, I saw a guy walk down Locust wearing an all Gucci outfit, just head to toe branded Gucci. I think my mouth was open just in shock. Um, so I definitely have had, uh, up until I got to college, a kind of fanciful idea of what, um, what going to college would mean that it, once I got there, once I finally got to this point that everything would be different, which isn't true. And I don't mean to say that to discourage anyone uh, coming in, but to definitely um, realize that access to this great education is definitely wonderful, but that it, take, it definitely takes a lot more hard work. It's, this is only a stepping stone into a lot of things to come. Um, my education has always been the one thing that I did have, even when everything else in my life was up and down, you know, with my family situation, financial situations, um, self-identity crisis, all those kinds of things. My education has really been um, steady and at the core of myself, and I'm definitely blessed because of it, but I also realized that it's not necessarily just about my education so much as what I can do with my education. Um, it's definitely made me realize that no one is normal. There is no such thing. We all have unique experiences, but we can all relate to one another. It's expanded my worldview, my view of life. Uh, my education has opened doors that weren't open for my family. And I hope that my pursuit of education allows doors to be opened that weren't open for, for pe other people in my life. So thank you. Thank you, Nair, for sharing that. Um, and thanks for everybody who's been commenting. This is such a positive space and, a, um, and the stories are so wonderful. So next it's gonna be uh, Sakshi. You're gonna be the third storyteller. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is um, Sakshi Sagal. I am a rising third year in the college. Um, I'm pursuing a bachelor's and master's in philosophy and I'm also on the pre-med track. 
some kind of all over the place <laughs> um, academically, but I'll, I'll describe like how I got there, um, I guess, when I talk about Penn. Um, but yeah, so I think when um, we sort of started planning for this preceptorial and I was thinking of, you know, what I wanted to share, what I wanted to define my fig leaf story, one of the things that I always feel like I struggle with in any sort of um, space where I'm supposed to discuss like parts of my life is sort of what forces and factors really contributed to who I am now and what sort of molded my journey to be at Penn and while I'm at Penn. And I figured the best way to sort of see what I guess my headspace was when applying to Penn was to see like my actual Penn application materials. So I pulled up like my Common App essay and then an essay that I didn't actually end up submitting to any colleges, but was super like raw and transparent about like a lot of the family issues that were so um, just very, I feel like vulnerably and emotionally written. It was almost like a diary where I was just like, oh, you know, maybe I'll use this to like apply to college. But it was sort of my feelings emerging from an environment that I knew I wanted to get out of. Um, and I think eventually brought me to Penn. So I think my story and like my, my story as a Figley student sort of starts off with my grandfather's dream on my dad's side. So he was an ambassador um, in India, um, and that's my heritage. I was actually born in New Delhi. And um, I, he, he had this dream for his four sons to you know, have an American education. It was sort of his version of the American dream in the 90s, and I think the version that a lot of people had. Um, and he wanted all of his sons to move to the US and sort of you know, build their lives ground up. So they all moved, and they all moved together. Um, and I, you know, moved at six months old to the U.S. Um, with my mom and we lived in a joint family. So basically what that is, is an extended family, like your extended family living with you. Um, so I, it, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And so we lived in a small suburb sort of outside Atlanta, um, in like a house I think meant for like a small nuclear family of like four people but eventually renovated it to a point where like by junior year it had like 16 people living in it so it was kind of a big space um with a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives and like visions on how they wanted to like run their lives and so my granddad was sort of the foundation of it all he had this vision for his like sons and their like children to sort of conquer all of their academic dreams and ambitions in the U.S. And he, you know, saw through to it. Like he made sure that they were, you know, essentially well settled in the U.S. Um, but when he passed away in 2007, um, it sort of like fell apart, right? And so when you have this anchor for like basically 20 people no longer there, like I think it's like a human tendency to sort of um, just have a lot of like negative emotions and just negativity sort of emerge. So I think what could have been a, like a harmonious interaction with all the cousins quickly devolved into um, just a not great space to have a lot of young kids. Um, and it's slowly, you know, from 2007 to like when I was seven to about like my senior year of high school, there were just constant fights. And it was sort of like, we were living on the outskirts of like Atlanta, right? But it just felt like in a lot of ways, like I couldn't do any of the things that my other friends could do. Like they couldn't come over. I shared a room with the rest of my family. Um, so in a lot of ways, like I feel like you could, I couldn't relate to a lot of my friends and it was definitely alienating in that sense. But like for the most part, it was like, you know, financially we were okay. Um, and my dad had actually joined my oldest uncle's professional business, like they were doing telecommunications together, um, which, you know, in 2002 seemed like a great idea, right? Like everything was fine. Um, and, you know, after my granddad passed away and there was no longer sort of this anchor, um, it seemed just like everything just like went to chaos. And, you know, starting in 2007 till like 2017, basically, my dad's income fell drastically because sort of the personal fights and all these issues about money and education and just petty things and so many people living together really had a huge financial impact and burden on like the four of us because my mom was working out, my mom was um, a stay at home mom. And, um, you know, my dad, his once stable income quickly, you know, was halved basically. Um, 
so we were in a way very much reliant on a system that felt really similar to sort of living in a hotel where you didn't like the people that you were living with, also didn't see them. Um, I felt like I saw like my teachers more than I saw like the people that live next door um, and my cousins. And then in middle school, I think, and sort of one of the reasons why I'm on the pre-med track, along with like this side tangent of the extended family fights and everything, um, my mom, who is like otherwise pretty healthy, started having like terrible unexplained headaches, um, just like like mind numbing pain and was like basically bedridden for about a year and a half and you know had all sorts of tests done like every test in the book um and it was inconclusive and it I think to me that was sort of like really like I don't know about like anything that's going on I felt like I had no control over the fights you know with the extended family I definitely had no control trying to you know diagnose my mom's headaches um weapon B became my best friend um, definitely wouldn't advise it because like one of the sites said that she had West Nile virus and I was like mm, I don't know if that's possible um, but it was definitely a lot of uncertainty and a lot of helplessness and a lot of really worrying because you have no idea with a neurological condition especially when you don't know what it is like what's going to happen the next day so there were a lot of times where I would just sort of like in seventh grade lie next to her and just stay up long hours into the night to just make sure she was breathing um, and I think it was at that point that I really decided that like I needed to be in a field where I could have better knowledge of what was going on. And I think like at 12, I decided that I needed to do something where I was more in control than I was at that point. Um, and also I think just more in control of like my environment. Like I did not want to raise my kids with like 15 people who like, I feel like hated my guts. Right. So, um, it definitely took a huge mental toll. It was a huge mental burden, but I don't think it sort of like boiled up until um, sort of my years in high school. I think, I mean, you guys I'm sure can relate, um, taking a lot of APs, doing a lot of extracurriculars. And I think for me, a lot of the incentive to do the extracurriculars was just to spend more time away from home. Um, and so the longer I could be at, you know, at Shambly, which is my high school from like 6 to 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. or like, yeah, I'll help like clean up that event that ends at 9 p.m. Just because it meant that I could stay a little bit further away from my reality and I could stay closer to something that I felt like I actually had control over and something that I could actually contribute to. Um, but it, I mean, it sucked because it's like you don't, you don't, like there's no incentive to study for something when I feel like you think that the future is just to stay in this environment, right? I think as um, people previous um, to me have said, it's sort of an expectation, I feel like, for girls in my culture and in a lot of cultures to just sort of like sit there and shut up and, you know, follow what is being said. And I hated that. I mean, I like to talk and I like to stand up for what's right. And I couldn't do that. And I think most importantly, I couldn't stand up for my mom in a lot of these fights. And so they were accusing her of terrible things every couple of months. And I just had to sit there and pretend like everything was fine. So I think that took a huge toll on mental health um, to the point where in junior year, we went to India to visit my mom's side of the family. Um, and my uncle, who's a doctor, you know, who I would always really enjoy like seeing and hanging out with and just having a great time in India with my cousins and things like, I mean, I was just sad like the entire time. And he was like, there's something clearly wrong, like with your mental health and with the impact that like this is having on you. Um, and eventually when we came back to Atlanta, um, apparently as to be expected, a lot of family fights had brewed in our absence to the point where we essentially had to move out with like a week's notice. Um, and again, I couldn't say anything, but at this point it was like, well, if like we're leaving and I'm almost a senior and you guys are going to say this stuff about my mom, like I'm going to stand up for what's right. And I did, but didn't get support from my dad. So it's just like, you know if we're finally standing up for what's right and what we've invested in, um, nothing came of it. And we had to move out like two days after we came back from an international trip. So we moved basically 45 minutes across the city um, with our clothes and like Kroger bags. Um, and I think like that day, I was just so tired of everything. You know, I think I had spent so much of high school trying my very hardest at school to sort of like please my parents or please the extended family. So 
things would be better and that just wasn't the case like we were still essentially evicted um and uh I was just very tired and I think it was like at that final point that I was like well now we don't have a lot of income we have a huge loan on our head and I kind of hate it here that I was like I just need to apply everywhere so I applied everywhere in state I applied um like out of state, I applied to places in the Midwest and California, Northeast, places that I'd never been. I think I applied to like Yale's campus in Singapore. So it's like wherever I could go, you know, wherever they would take me and they would give me money, I would go. Um, and I actually also applied to like a lot of scholarships at that point. So I applied to like the Jack and Cook Foundation, Gay Scholarship, um, and Coca-Cola, because I was like, yeah, Atlanta, Coca-Cola, yay. And they rejected me a week later. So I was like, well, that's that. Um, and um I actually applied to Princeton early action just because I had like seen a poster for them um, in my school's counseling office and knew that they were like really generous with financial aid. And so knowing nothing else about Princeton, I was like, all right, well, let's just apply there. Um, and then slowly in spring semester, I was really fortunate to have acceptances roll in and have the ability to attend a school like Penn. Um, and so ultimately for me, it came down to Penn and Johns Hopkins. And so my mom was super happy about Johns Hopkins. She had always wanted me to go there. I think for her, it was sort of like the pre-medical dream. Um, and that was the first time that I visited either of those campuses in the spring. Um, and I think like I visited both campuses and I feel like give it sort of a fair chance, but I think just being on Penn's campus first and like walking a locust walk and just like feeling sort of the vibe of all these ambitious students around me was just so contagious. I was like, these people are like me. Like they're so passionate about what they do. They're extroverted. Um, and yeah, they're just very ambitious. Um, and I think that's something that I've felt like every day at Penn um, on good days and on bad days. And so um, after senior year, I when I moved up to Penn, um, just echoing what Makaya just said, um, yeah, it was, it's hard. It was hard being a pre-med and I took Gen Chem 1 first actually. And so I'm in the college, but like an idiot because I didn't know about like the difference between professors for the engineering school and the college. I took Gen Chem 1 in the engineering school, which as you can expect was, you know, a little bit hard. <laughs> um, and, you know, for a professor that wasn't really favored. And I, yeah, I got like a 67, like for all three tests. And I was like, well, this is terrific. Like I, the high that I feel like I was writing out in my senior year having like gone well was like so quickly like grounded. It was just unbelievable. But, but um, yeah, I came home to Atlanta and I had so much imposter syndrome. I think a lot of it was like, well, do I really want to do this? Like, I don't think I'm cut out for this. I think the other hard thing for me was, um, there were other students from Atlanta that I had met at Penn who had gone to Westminster, which is like a super big private school here. Um, and um, I just, I mean, I don't know, like correlation or causation or whatever, but I felt like they were a lot better at the sciences than I was. And I was like, look, we barely had a chemistry teacher and I'm okay with that. Like, I'm proud that I had some chemistry from high school, but it definitely impacted how I did in chemistry. And so in, at Penn, and so um yeah, it, it just sucked. And so starting in spring semester, I went to CAPS. And so I had to talk about a lot of like the repressed trauma from home and all those years of living in this like unnatural environment, I feel like. Um, and just having to like really come to terms with like my different interests and being okay with like being interested in, you know, not just like being pre-med, but also doing something humanities related. And I think that like very heavily influenced my ultimate decision to like stick with philosophy and like pursue that interest. I mean, still some friction with my family, but you know, I, Penn has given me the resources and opportunities to like pursue whatever it is that I want to do. And I'm super thankful for it. Um, and I think it's definitely been sort of a learning process to be okay with my journey. I think it's been really easy for me to compare myself to people like me in my classes who I feel like have a lot of prior knowledge coming in and to not feel like an idiot constantly while that's happening. I think it's just been important for me to like remind my roots and remind me, remind myself of my roots and um, remind myself of, you know, sort of what I escaped from and how glad I am that I'm not going to like a community college, like 10 minutes away from home. Um, and so, yeah, I think the Figley community has a huge role in letting me be able to do that and just Penn in general. So, so yeah, um, feel free to reach out to me with um, questions and things like that. I'd love to, to talk with you more. 
Thank you so much, Shakshay. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable and sharing that. Um, we have around 15 minutes left. Um, so let's do John and then Erica. We might go a little over time, but that's okay. Um, if people want to stick around, you can. If you, you know, don't, you can't, then it's okay. Um, so thank you, Sakshi. Let's go next to John. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is John. I'm a rising junior at Penn and studying physics and biochem right now. Um, I guess I'll just jump to my story then. Um, so as a first gen student, my parents constantly raised me with the mindset of academics, I would say. And I was always told, like, even as starting as like, a first grader, that grades would somehow be the key to success in life. And it was in that, like, I believe that getting A's on my exams would somehow let everything fall into place. And when I started thinking about college as a high schooler, it seemed as though, like, the general theme, once again, was to get good grades, score well in the SAT, and then I wouldn't have to see my parents work such bad breaking hours. And so I did such that, right? I studied diligently alongside other commitments, and after applying for a few schools, I ended up getting accepted to Penn. And I thought the typical formula would basically be the same thing here, right? So focus my time and effort and energy on school, and then I would somehow emerge successful, right? And as an originally intended MD-PhD MD -PhD student back then, I felt as though this path made the most sense, right? And if you all know like the triangle analogy thing, it's like you have academics, social life, and sleep, right? And I definitely focused like originally my freshman year, 60% of my energy into academics, 30% to social, and then 10% sleep. And personally, like, I really stopped at nothing. Like, I worked so hard, like, in academics um, and, like, did not get enough sleep, like, personally, because I wanted nothing more but to graduate, get a job, and help alleviate a lot of the work stress off my parents' back, right? And it always hurt to see my parents so exhausted all the time. But knowing that my parents and family viewed me as the key out of their current living situation, it really motivated me to drive my path forward, right? So in thinking in terms of like my academic focus, I sought to take as many classes as possible. My first semester here, um, I tried to make things as difficult as possible for myself to challenge myself intellectually. I also befriended people who wanted to do similar things. And when you surround yourself with a certain crowd, right, you usually follow that crowd. And I decided to take this really difficult physics course my first semester, uh, honors physics or something, right? And I was really nervous for my first exam then. And like, keep in mind, this was not only my first physics exam, but my first ever exam as a college student. So, of course, um, as life goes, I woke up five minutes before that exam with pink eye and bronchitis, um, scurried over to DRL, which is the physics building and math building, and tried taking my exam. Now, if we're being completely realistic with ourselves here, it was a little bit difficult to see the words and numbers in front of me. I remember my pencil was like slipping on my hand, just, just not a good day. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, I did really bad on the exam. It was probably one of the worst grades I've ever seen in my entire life. And despite the fact that it was like honestly completely out of my control, I felt as though in that moment, it was just so crushing to see my academic fears came come to life, right? Like being raised with a sense of academics, right? I really thought I had failed my parents. I felt as though I was stupid and unintelligent. And I had the option to drop the course with no obligations, right? So this class was being during the drop period, but I decided to stay. And it was mainly because I felt as though my classmates all around me knew what they were doing. And I felt as though if I was dropping the class, I was not only gonna look at stupid from my parents, but also in front of my peers. And in my mind, right, in my mind, academics played such a huge priority that it affected my decisions for reasons that weren't even my inherent fault. So for those of you that are like incoming freshmen, or actually everybody here actually, right, there's a thing here called pen face, where it's this conception that everybody around you knows what they're doing, right? Everybody around you seems smarter than you. Everybody like next to me seems to have 17 different clubs, right? And then the person on my left seems to have their internship lined up next summer, maybe even like their next internship for 2022. And I'm not afraid to admit that I completely succumbed to that my first like semester here. However, after staying this class, I kind of realized in reality, everybody was putting on this facade. Everybody was putting on their pen face. No one knew what was going on, right? This class was just so difficult that the materials were literally just soaring past people's heads. And while I survived the final, it definitely came with a lot of costs, including putting more time and energy into academics, late nights, all nighters, just like everything bad, right? And even though I like survived this course, um, I think I definitely learned a lot. Well, not so much on the physics side, I would say, but I think more like me personally. <laughs> so two things I definitely learned were, firstly, it's so important to not necessarily care about what other people are thinking about you. And face is really, really conducive towards creating this extremely toxic environment where people are literally always trying to put each other down. It might not even be on purpose, right? 
But people will always talk about the best things going on in their lives, but never talk about the work or failures that they had to go through to get to where they are right now. And it's so, so crucial to remember that, but to also remember to make decisions that are in your best interest. Which kind of leads into my main point. Academics are not everything in college, right? Remember how I had the decision to drop this course to take the normal version of physics? I really should have done that, but I didn't realize these sort of honors courses weren't really going to help me too much in the future. And at that time, I thought it was going to be challenged. I thought it was going to be like, oh, get an A in this class, and somehow I'll become like a doctor and do well in school, and then my parents will be happy. But like, what about that lost time that I could have spent making more friends or joining more clubs? All this like opportunity cost, the marginal gain I literally got from learning this class wasn't worth everything I had to give up to actually like do well in the class in the end. And I honestly didn't realize how academics wasn't really the core of everything until maybe the beginning of like 2020, right before COVID hit everything. But like this last semester, right, I overloaded myself with too many credits once again, with the goal of getting like a double major in masters. However, I really just constantly found myself asking the question, why? Is this, is this all the school really going to help me succeed in the future? And personally, I found myself getting more and more involved with entrepreneurship and business and found that the time I spent there was just so much more exciting than taking another class. And these sort of like opportunities would never have arisen if I didn't go to Penn, for example. I probably would still be pre-med if I was at JHU. <laughs> um, but I think then I discovered that classes aren't everything. Your major doesn't even necessarily dictate what you're going to do in the future. Like personally, right now, I'm recruiting for like investment banking consulting, and I'm studying physics and biochem, right? There's literally no relationship there. And moreover, I think definitely you'll hear people talking about, oh, I'm taking like four classes or five classes. Just keep in mind that the number of classes you take in the semester literally doesn't mean anything besides bragging rights. And bragging rights don't turn into job offers or med school sentences. And in short, I truly wish I hadn't been so focused on academics when I first came to Penn. And I wish I gave myself more time and more opportunities to explore like Penn environment when I was just like a budding freshman. And I wish I hadn't been so focused on thinking about like what other people thought about my own intellect. But at the same time, right, this isn't me saying that school doesn't matter. This is more me saying, like, get good grades, but don't push yourself so hard academically that you start to take time out of your social and extracurricular life. There's a really, really fine balance between everything here. And, like, personally, going back to the triangle analogy now, I think my life has gone to, like, 40, 45% academics, 45% social, and 10% sleep. Sleep is another discussion, but we'll, we'll go through it later. Um, and personally, like, if you have the opportunity to take four classes, go for it, right? Just use your free time wisely, you join some clubs, make some friends, launch a business. I don't know, just don't waste your time. Time is a very valuable thing in this world. And personally, like these early years were definitely not a waste. Um, I definitely learned so much about myself and learned so much about the world around me. And it really allowed me to grow and realize the importance of being humble and thankful for everything that has allowed me to get to where I am today, like being able to stand and speak in front of everybody here. But as a final note, as a final takeaway, Please keep your eyes open for new opportunities. Acknowledge that PenFace exists and remember that academics are truly not everything that you're here for at Penn. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for just all the insights and for sharing, you know, all about that. The pen face is real. And I think um, the imposter syndrome you touched a little bit about on Friday, there's going to be a session. Um, so I hope that all of you consider going to that session as well. Thank you, John. Our last but not least speaker is Erica. Erica, it's your turn. <laughs> Hello everyone. First of all, thank you all for sharing your stories. I really like them and I feel related to them. I guess I will start with my introduction. Um, my name is Erika Trevino and I am a rising junior majoring in mathematical economics. Um, I was born and raised in Mexico. Up to ninth grade, I attended public schools. If you are Mexican, I don't think there's any Mexican here, but if you are, maybe you know how public schools and overall the Mexican education system can be improved. Um, but that's another topic. Um, yeah, uh, I remember that when I was in middle school, I loved high school musicals so bad. I always wonder how it would be to study in a place like East High. <laughs> I didn't even know English back then, but I used to tell my mom, of course, in Spanish, uh, mom, I'm going to study in the U.S. in the future. Little did I know that to study in the U.S., I needed tons of money because school is way too expensive. Long story short, um, in junior high, I realized that going to college in the U.S. was more like an almost impossible dream. How was I going to get the resources needed to study in a different country? I didn't even know if my parents were going to be able to pay for my college in my city. Moreover, at that time, my English skills were poor. <laughs> I was kid for reality, or in other words, I was discouraged by it. 
um, my goals then were just to continue being a good student, get to finish high school and with a lot of effort from my parents and myself, maybe go to college in my city. Uh, I must say that uncertainty of going to college or not is definitely not bad at all. Considering that a lot of my middle school and junior high classmates couldn't even finish uh, or go to high school, um, their dreams were cut short. Luckily for me, Alpha Fundacion, um, in English it would be something like Foundation Alpha, uh, got into my life. This foundation is funded by the Grupo Alpha, which is a Mexican conglomerate. Uh, a little bit of context here, uh, Mexican schools, or the ones I know, uh, work like this. You go to school at 7.30 a.m. and then you leave at 12.30 p.m. So basically, uh, kids do nothing the rest of the day unless their parents take them to classes, which is really hard because sometimes this is really expensive. Or if you can take some classes offered by the government, it takes time. Um, and yeah, so parents sometimes are not willing to spend that extra time taking their kids to a class or for many reasons, maybe they have to pay public transportation to get there and that adds extra costs to taking your kids to a class. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, why schools don't offer <laughs> extracurriculars? Well, that's how, that's not how things work here in Mexico. Um, it's very rare to find a public school that offers extracurricular activities after 12.30 p.m. Um, in my case, my extracurricular was just taking one hour of dance classes at something like a community gym uh, near my house. So what Alpha Foundation, what I talked about uh, before, did was just take kids from junior high to a different place every school day from 12.30 to 5.30. So they kept gay kids uh, who were part of Alpha an opportunity to do something else in the afternoons. They taught us uh, different subjects, helped us with classes and our homework, and also offered other extracurriculars. Alpha also has a private high school, which I was part of. Uh, what I can say is that thanks to my wonderful teachers there, I learned how to learn. Um, there I was also told that my dreams were not impossible at all, and that maybe I could get a scholarship to go to college, uh, whatever I wanted. I was like, for real, you're telling me that people and universities are willing to pay for my education, like people who I don't know. And they were like, yeah, <laughs> definitely. My parents never told me that. Like my parents didn't know that scholarship existed for international students, right? Um, and also I didn't feel not good enough to get one. Um, well, so in brief, Alpha helped me with the entire process, paid for the applications and here I am. If I could say something about the application process, it would be that it was a lot, and I'm sure you know this. No one I knew had done it before. Most of the people in my surroundings didn't even know the names of the schools I was applying to. I didn't even know what an Ivy League was <laughs> until I was applying. Um, I don't know if this happened to you, but I also cried. I cried a lot of times during the process. I wanted to give up. Um, if it wasn't for the very supportive teachers, my friends and my family, um, I don't know if I would be here. And I know I'm very lucky because I was in the right time and in the right place. I was a good student, but I know there are tons of many other wonderful students, Mexican or from other countries who weren't given the chance to expand their horizons, who cannot go to college even in their own countries. Um, well, so the day I had to move to camp, move into campus, um, I cried even more, but this time those were like happy tears. <laughs> which is good. <laughs> I was my first time traveling by plane and I was completely alone in this, but I enjoyed the process. I remember everything I did that day. Um, I felt like in my own high school musical, like movie. <laughs> um, and then like cafeterias were full of food at 10. Like it was like a buffet every day and I love that. Uh, freshman 15 is real. <laughs> and also just like you meet people from all around the world. And also you live in a dorm. I know a lot of people hate this, like living in a dorm, but I loved it. It was part of the freshman experience at my time, my time and probably in the future you'll get to experience that, hopefully. Um, and also you have like huge classrooms and the architecture of the building is just amazing. I love Penn. And there are like a lot of other good stuff about Penn. Um, but also there are many good things that are some that are not so good. I could really like make a long list about this. I will just say a couple of them. Um, being completely alone, at least at the beginning, as an international student, uh, I was like, I didn't know anyone in Philadelphia or even in Pennsylvania. 
So yeah, seeing how a lot of my classmates' parents help them with the moving process. As I told you, um, my parents don't have a visa, so I was alone and no one was helping me. So sometimes I felt a little bit jealous about that. But yeah, um, not understanding cultural differences at all. Um, yeah, sometimes you might think that you're doing something good, but it might affect other people. You don't know, because we have different, we come from different backgrounds. Um, adjusting to a completely different academic model and in a different language. Um, I have a, a funny story about this. Well, maybe it wasn't funny for me my first semester, but it's funny now. Um, I remember my second class at Penn was uh, Econ 01, which is Intro to Microeconomics. And my teacher, um, well, something that I, I thought after that class was, how in the world am I going to handle this? Because my teacher was French and I hadn't been exposed to different uh, accents before. So I was in the class trying to like translate everything she was saying in my head. She was so fast that I couldn't understand anything. Like I remember that the only thing that I, I remember after that class, it was that we talked about opportunity cost. And I only remember like the little, like, the word opportunity cost, not what the concept was, right? Um, but if you're an international, uh, don't worry about it. If this happens to you, you will get used to it uh, with time. But yeah, that's really hard for me. That first class, I, I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> but yeah, another thing, just seeing how much expensive, um, how much more expensive is everything in the US. Like literally with what I buy one meal for me, I can buy like food for three people in Mexico. Uh, as an international Piglet student, uh, I and probably a lot of other Piglet students faced some extra struggles that sometimes other students or Piglets or not like take for granted. Um, some of them are like having to apply for financial aid every year and explaining or translating to your to your parents like what you need from them. Always thinking if you have enough money to go to that restaurant with your friends or if you just have enough to pay for your toiletries. Mm -hmm. Like literally explain to your parents why you do everything you do and why it is not a waste of time. Sometimes it's something different that they are not used to and you have to explain them why it is important for you. Um, having to explain to your classmates that even though you're international, you are, your family is not wealthy at all. So that's uh, something I didn't know, that's a stereotype. Like sometimes people relate international with being wealthy and that's not, that's not it. Like there's people like me. Um, the struggle to make the decision to go back to your home country or not during summer because you felt so homesick during the school year and your family wanted you back but also you wanted to explore more your career options and also people from our country are super proud of us and we don't want to disappoint them so feeling like you have to keep them feeling proud by joining a lot of clubs or putting your health at risk because you don't eat well and put all nighters just to get an A, an a in the class, like uh, John was saying, because a lot of other students would love to be in your shoes. And I can continue, but I have to stop. Definitely not everything is negative, but I just wanted to like tell you a couple of things that have happened to me and that not a lot of people mention while being at Penn. And if you're a figly or not, if you're an international figly or not, uh, what I want you to take from this is that we all face our own struggles and accomplishments. We are not, uh, we are not all the same. For me, the biggest struggle was the language barrier. And I'm working on that right now. <laughs> and I've been working on that for years. Um, but yeah, but for other figlies or international figlies, it might be something completely different. Uh, hopefully after this presentorial, um, you won't see all figlies alike because while it is true that we are from the same group, we are also individuals and we all uh, have our own stories. So yeah, if you have any questions, I will leave my email uh, on the chat box. But yeah, happy to talk to you all. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you, thank you. Um, so thank you everybody who joined us tonight. Um, we are at time. And before you leave this preceptorial, I just shared the survey link um, into the chat box. So please fill out that survey for the NSO team. And thank you for, for joining our danger of a single figly story, right? Like Erica said, we 
you know, students may be first gen low income, but they come from all walks of life. And I'm sure everybody who's on this call also has their own stories. And if you are a Figley student, you know, may these stories uh, be mirrors for you. You know, you see yourselves in each other. And if you are not a Figley student and you're listening to all these stories, may this be a window for you to see into a different experience that you may not know about. Um, so thank you for joining us for the, singer of a, the danger of a single Figley story. Um, tomorrow we will be doing another preceptorial. So please join us for that, um, talking about the civil rights movement and there will be Penn alum and students who will be sharing their experience with um, the civil rights movement and how that uh, kind of translates into contemporary times. So thank you all, take the survey and have a good night.